magnificent distances. The largest ocean in the world, 34 times bigger than the continent of Europe. It covers 70 million square miles, roughly one third of the Earth's surface. In 1941, the fastest luxury liner took five days to make its landfall at Honolulu. First port of call on the voyage to Yokohama. Over 3,000 miles and nine days further away. Of course, if you were in a great hurry, like Japan's special envoy, Suburu Kurasu, in December 1941, you could make the trip by air in two days, 13 hours, and 15 minutes. The Pacific is an ocean of many moods. To the north, the Aleutian winds are icy and unpredictable. Here, as is said, weather is born. To the south, in equatorial heat, the sunsets are of unparalleled beauty. Here, rising from the blue, shark-infested waters, lie jungles, dense and malaria. Volcanoes, like Krakatoa, which once exploded with a violence that shook the world. It is an ocean of islands with names once strange to Western ears. Tarawa, Saipan, Iwo Jima. Names now almost as familiar as Gettysburg, Trafalgar, Verdun. Islands inhabited by little known peoples, Polynesians, Melanesians, and Micronesians. We had caught glimpses of them in the movies, dancing their hip dances, chanting their island songs. At one time, some had been cannibals, but now most were good-natured and friendly living in what writers like Herman Melville and Jack London had described as an approximation of paradise. Since 6.55 a.m. Honolulu time, Sunday, December 7th, 1941, this paradise has been a battlefield. The Pacific Ocean is the biggest, the strangest, the most complex battlefield in history. To understand what distance in the Pacific really means, touch the point of a pencil to the map. Under this tiny point may be arrayed all the ships of the United States Navy in battle formation. Yet, these ships must be so disposed and so employed as to exert an influence and control over the whole Pacific area. Land war is familiar to the people of Europe and Asia. A massive war of tanks locked in battle, of men deploying, maneuvering along highways, canals, railroads, in city streets, in buildings of brick and stone. But it is different in the Pacific, where there are no highways, no railroads, only the limitless lanes of the sea. Along these lanes, stretching thousands of miles to bases on fighting fronts in every corner of the Pacific, the war must be carried to the enemy by ship, by what has been and will continue to be the greatest concentration of shipping in history. There is a special kind of ship for every mission. This is the battleship, known to the men of the fleet as the Battle Wagon. A floating fortress belted with armor plate, 15-inch guns, 50 feet long, which can hurl their projectiles into a bullseye 20 miles away. Light and heavy cruisers, scouts and watchdogs, fast and elusive, able to hold their own in the heaviest actions. The destroyer, the tin can, a fragile steel shell crammed with horsepower, moving at express train speed to protect slower vessels with guns, torpedoes, and depth charges. 
Marine, the lone prowler, operating for as much as 60 days in enemy waters, thousands of miles from its base. The aircraft carrier, the flat top, backbone of the fleet today. A floating airport as big as three football fields laid end to end. A huge and complicated mechanism able to hurl a hundred planes into battle across the horizon. Following the fighting ships are the indispensable ships of the train. Repair ships, tankers, transports. With landing craft, they carry the fuel, ammunition, machine shops, food and drinking water, everything to enable the fighting ships to stay at sea farther from their bases and in more continuous action than any fleet in history. The fighting ships and their auxiliaries are arranged in groups called task forces, a new concept developed in peacetime years by the United States Navy and proved in battle in this war. Each task force is in itself a fleet, self-contained and self-sustaining, a solar mission, convoy, reconnaissance, or attack. And as the task force principle is new, almost all the ships themselves are new, built and commissioned since war began. Their officers and men have carried the war to the very doorstep of Japan. They too are new. Only a few years ago, most of these young veterans were at home, playing football and baseball, studying at schools, working in factories or on farms, growing up in the dream that war had been outlawed in their time. While they were growing up in the 20s and 30s, Scores of American warships lay deserted and unmanned, gathering rust in quiet harbors. Others, half finished, had been sold for scrap or sent to the bottom of the sea. This was the result of deliberate policy. Peace through disarmament was the spirit which moved the Washington Arms Conference of 1922 and the London Conference of 1930. Statesmen of those days, with the best of intentions, have forgotten the words of the anonymous admiral of 1918. The means to wage war must be kept in the hands of those who hate war. In America's case, geography was an additional factor. She was 6,000 miles from danger in the west, 3,000 in the east. Most Americans came to believe that a comparatively small navy was protection enough for their isolated sea coasts. But in the middle thirties, events in Europe and Asia began to change America's thinking. She began to prepare to throw her weight into the world's struggle against fascism and aggression. And by September 1939, whatever remained of her old complacency was gone for good. In quick succession, Congress passed the Lend-Lease Act, which made America, in fact, the arsenal of democracy. The so-called Two Ocean Navy Bill. The United States Navy was reborn. The Selective Service Act, to mobilize the nation's young manhood. But time was running short. It ran out on what began as just another American Sunday. submarines, perhaps 150 men. 
It was, on the surface, the cheapest bargain in history. But by the morning of December 8th, thanks to Japanese treachery and deceit, Americans were aroused to the depths of their souls. They now stood shoulder to shoulder of one mind, of one purpose, with the peoples of all free nations everywhere. Through crowded streets, America's great war leader, the late President Roosevelt, drove to the capital. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Yes, America said, as the nation's youth put aside the ways of peace and turned to war, we would gain the inevitable triumph. But how? With what? And against all their enemies, whomsoever, and that I will obey the orders of the president. Part of the answer would have to come from these. Fifty million men and women, trained and untrained, skilled and unskilled, Part of the answer lay here. As a result of Lend-Lease, American industry was already partly on a war footing. But ahead lay giant tasks. Reconversion, re-engineering, retooling. as always, would have to come from the men who would meet the enemy face to face. Boys from the forests of the Northwest, the mines and factories of the East, the farms of the Midwest, the cotton fields and cane breaks of the South. Could these millions, trained only in the ways of peace, be taught to handle rifle and grenade, airplane and warship? Could they be welded into a fighting force able to master the veteran warriors of Germany and Japan? Time was of the essence. Time to draw blueprints. Time to lay keels. To retool factories. Time to train men. The demand was astronomical. Far beyond the capacity of the factories, still inadequately equipped still inadequately trained. On every front, in Europe, Africa, in Asia, the United Nations fought with their backs to the wall. And in the Pacific, time was doubly the enemy. Here in December 1941, the Navy had available 80 combat ships. To these, America's British and Dutch allies could add at most another 50. Against them, the Japanese could bring to bear at least 186 combat ships. These could operate from home bases protected by concentric rings of island bases, unsinkable carriers, they were called. America, on the other hand, could count on exactly seven all too sinkable carriers, only four of them available for duty in the Pacific. Japan took full advantage of her newfound superiority. She exploded in all directions. In less than five months, she had overrun a million and a half square miles in southeastern Asia and the southwest Pacific. The oil fields of the Indies were hers. She had 95% of all the world's supply of raw rubber. Two-thirds of all the tin. She had copper and lead and zinc. 90% of all the quinine in the world. She had completed the conquest of 125 million people. Unlimited slave labor. Overnight, Japan had carved out for herself the second largest empire in the world. Fire! 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 
Fleet Headquarters, Pearl Harbor, the United States Navy's Pacific Command faced a staggering task. First, the sunken ships had to be raised, refloated, re-equipped, rearmed. It was the greatest salvage job in history. In time, all but two of these ships would again stand out to sea, more heavily armored and gunned than ever before, but not for months to come. Meanwhile, every available combat ship was sent out to search for the enemy, to harass him, hinder him, to delay him. Everywhere in the Pacific, it was the same story of gallant, sometimes hopeless campaigns conducted by officers and men who did the best they could with the little they had. Often, it was a few overaged destroyers setting out to engage a battle fleet. A few Americans, British, a handful of PT boats, every last available ship in the Dutch Navy. Later, these small forces would be called the Bow and Arrow Navy. They took their losses, not stopping to count their dead in the Macassar Strait, the Banduin Strait, the Java Sea. In days to come, when the tiny pieces called battles could be slipped into the overall pattern called war, the job they did in the Pacific would assume its rightful place in history. From the beginning, the men of the undersea arm contributed more than their share. Their forays to the very harbor mouths of Japan helped check the enemy in the full tide of his advance. The Navy's airmen did their part. Small carrier task forces launched daring attacks on Japanese bases, foretastes of the mighty aerial strikes to come. They hit at the Gilberts and the Marshalls, at Distant Wake and Marcus, at Salamaua and Lai. They learned as they fought, from admirals like Halsey to pilots and plane handlers. They taught themselves the tactics of a new and spectacular kind of warfare. They improvised and invented. On the gray morning of April 18th, 1942, Army bombers, led by Colonel Jimmy Doolittle, rose from the decks of the carrier Hornet, only 500 miles from the coast of Japan. Captain Mitcher and his men gave them a cheer as they disappeared into a scud of clouds to drop their bombs on Tokyo itself. for a showdown in two major actions. The Battle of the Coral Sea and the Battle of Midway. The first blow was aimed at Australia. Early in May, a powerful Japanese task force was observed moving south into the Coral Sea. An American force moved to intercept. Aircraft exchanged blows. It was the first naval engagement in history in which surface ships did not exchange a single shot. But the men of the still small Pacific fleet were sure that the Battle of the Coral Sea could be only a preliminary to the main offensive effort of Japan. For the enemy, there were two logical targets. One, the still unfinished naval base at Dutch Harbor in the Aleutian Islands key to Alaska, Western Canada, and the American Northwest. The other target was Midway Island, western outpost of Pearl Harbor itself. A Japanese victory here would open an invasion path straight to the American mainland. On the commander-in-chief of the Pacific Ocean areas, Admiral Chester W. Nimitz rested the burden of determining where the blow would fall and how to meet it. He knew that defeat at either Midway or Dutch Harbor would affect not only the Pacific War, but would be felt across the world in the war against Germany. Every available ship and plane was prepared for action. 
carrier Yorktown, damaged in the Coral Sea, had sped to Pearl Harbor to be patched up. Army flying fortresses were dispatched to reinforce marine aviation groups on outlying islands. The first blow fell in the north. At daybreak on June 3rd, 1942, Dutch Harbor reported an attack by a strong Japanese force. But Admiral Nimitz sensed that this was a diversion only, not the main blow. He ordered his carrier force to the west. As the small American force sailed from Pearl Harbor for its rendezvous with destiny, it carried into the Pacific the hopes of the free world. To the west, a vast weather front was rolling toward Midway. On June 3rd, a Navy patrol bomber nosed up to the weather front and made the first contact with the enemy. The Japanese were approaching in two columns. One was the expectant occupation force. Transports packed with soldiers and Imperial Japanese Marines protected by a formidable array of fighting ships. The other was the striking arm, the Japanese Navy's four finest aircraft carriers, escorted by battleships, heavy cruisers, and destroyers. The Army fortresses, although somewhat new at this game, found the Southern, or occupation force. They went in and scored hits on a cruiser and a transport. That night, the Navy patrol bombers followed up with an attack on the occupation force. They scored at least two damaging hits and sank a cargo vessel. The next day, the enemy had moved within range of Midway. Marine air squadrons found the striking force. battleship was set afire, and at least one hit was scored on a carrier. But at the same time, Japanese attack groups were giving the island a savage pound. The enemy forces moved in for the kill. But still, they had not detected the approaching American task force. The speeding American carriers were still out of range. For 24 hours, their radio loudspeakers had been bringing in snatches of the actions being fought west of Midway. Where's the plane? Keep it up there. All right, all right. Keep rhyming, another bat coming. Through all this, the Navy flyers had had to sit and sweat it out. Twice, the loudspeakers had ordered them up from their ready rooms. Twice, the orders had been rescinded. At a time like this, they grumbled, you'd think they'd get things straight up there. But up there, had to make sure of the exact course and location of the Japanese. Sure that his own planes could reach them, hit them, and still have fuel enough to return. At last, it was time. Pilot, find your plane. American flyers began to suspect that something had gone wrong. The Jap was not where he was expected to be. We know now that he had turned back. Perhaps he had learned at last of the oncoming American carriers. At 11 o'clock, Commander Waldron of the Hornets Torpedo Squadron 8 found the enemy. He was short of fuel and had outrun his fighter support. Nevertheless, he attacked. Of his squadron, only one man, Ensign Gay, lived to inflate his life raft on the sea. He saw his comrades from the Hornet, the Enterprise, and the Yorktown plunge into the Japanese fleet. They went for the carriers first, 
In quick sequence, they pounded them into flaming hulks. Kaga, Akagi, Soryu. And with them, two battleships were left burning. But one carrier, the Hiryu, escaped for the time being, long enough for a Parthian shot which crippled the Yorktown. Simultaneously, the attack groups from the three American carriers had smashed the Hiryu into blazing wreckage. For several days, the American flyers delivered textbook attacks on the enemy's battleships and cruisers, now naked of aerial defense. The once clean blue sea was spotted for hundreds of miles with oil slicks and wreckage. By sunset on June 6th, the Battle of Midway had already taken its place beside Jutland, Trafalgar, and the route of the Spanish Armada. Intelligence officers began to tally up the score. On the morning of June 7th, the men of the victorious American fleet began to bury their dead. As in the skies over Britain two years before, a few had earned the gratitude of the many. Midway, like Stalingrad in the Battle of Britain, was a turning point in the war. It marked the golden moment when men could tell themselves at last that victory was possible in the Pacific. The initiative now rested securely in the hands of the United States Navy, never again to be relinquished. To the Allied Chiefs of Staff in Washington, the initiative won at Midway was an opportunity only, not an accomplishment. Though the enemy had been beaten back, there was no tendency to underestimate him. His record of achievement was plain for all to see. He was entrenched in his stolen island empire as firmly as his German ally was entrenched in Europe and Africa. In planning their offensive, the chiefs of staff had to keep in mind the nature of the Japanese. In total war, the psychology of the enemy is of first importance to the strategist. Unconditional surrender was a long way off. But two months after the Battle of Midway, the Navy took its first offensive step in the Solomon Islands, north of the Coral Sea. On Guadalcanal, the Japanese were building an airfield to menace supply routes to Australia. This was the first objective. The name Guadalcanal has been written into history. With other names like Tarawa and Iwo Jima, Bougainville and Peleliu, it has become a symbol not merely of one battle on one remote island, but of all the battles fought up the ladder of islands leading to Japan. On Guadalcanal, the outnumbered, outgunned marines first found out what it meant to fight the Japanese at close quarters. In the stinking jungle, they lived through a nightmare six months long. Offshore, American and Australian ships were engaged in no less desperate battle. The enemy spared nothing in his effort to save Guadalcanal. From August to December, the sea actions flamed. Night actions in which frequently almost every ship engaged was hit. Japanese attacks ended. The weary Blue Jackets had driven the enemy from waters he already considered his own. The weary Marines of Guadalcanal could take pride in two great achievements. 
they had taken the first step on the long road to Tokyo, and they had mastered the savage arts of jungle warfare. But now some were going home. Others had already gone to hospitals on other islands, where Navy doctors and nurses were pioneering new horizons in battle surgery and tropical medicine. And whole islands were also set aside where tired men could recapture a little of the easygoing life they had nearly forgotten. find a little rest and have a little fun. Though some men rested, the offensive strategy of the United Nations could not. In November 1943, America's commander-in-chief flew to Cairo to meet with the war leaders of Great Britain and China. Here in the shadow of the pyramids, they affirmed the Allied program for unrelenting attack in the Pacific. They had the weapons now. There were warships of every type. American industry and labor were meeting the test of global war. They had used well the time bought for them by the bow and arrow navy of the early days. By the outnumbered heroes on Bataan, by the men who fought in the Coral Sea, at Midway, on Guadalcanal. By the free peoples everywhere in the Pacific, who had steadfastly resisted Japanese aggression. And by the Chinese, who for eight long years had stood off the full onslaught of the Japanese armies. These mighty bombers were built on time, bought by the sacrifice of British, Australians, New Zealanders and Dutch. These giant stockpiles were built up while guerrillas in the Philippines and the Netherlands East Indies were fighting the enemy with little more than hope. And even more important, the United Nations now had men for the Pacific. Blue jackets to handle the complex machinery of modern sea power. Airmen, soldiers and marines trained for amphibious and jungle warfare. And all these were but the vanguard of a host of others still in training camps. Under their commanders, Fleet Admiral Nimitz in the Central Pacific and Army General Douglas MacArthur in the Southwest, by the side of their allies, they were ready to push attack. What they accomplished is history. From Guadalcanal and New Guinea, the Allied advance gathered momentum, striking from airfields on key islands, taking this base, bypassing that. Short steps at first, but as America's power grew, lengthening into giant strides, the world began to hear of strange places. Yosha and Tarawa, Kwajalein and Eitan, Biak and Saipan, Peleliu and Morata. And as the pace increased, more familiar names would come back into the news. The Philippines. of Japan itself. But the real story of the oceanic phase of the Pacific War cannot be told in maps and communiques. It can be told only in terms of human effort and human sacrifice. A task force can weigh anchor to sail against the enemy only because thousands of officers and men ashore have worked long months at the tremendous and exacting job of planning. Though an order only six words long may initiate an amphibious attack, not a gun will fire, not a plane will be airborne, not a marine will hit the beach until millions of other words have been written down. In crisp sentences, in codes, on charts and maps, in mathematical equations, 
photographs and models, the attack is written as a play is written. Long before the actors take the stage, from battle fleets to chocolate bars, from the horsepower of a thousand planes to the tide tables of a once forgotten tropical island, no detail can be omitted. Yet all this planning is for one ultimate purpose, to put this man and his rifle ashore on a hostile beach. This is the eve of battle. This is the eve of Guadalcanal, of Tarawa, of Palau, Leyte, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. George V is paying off the debt of another called Prince of Wales. 
soldiers. From hard experience, they know what lies ahead. The enemy has had years to fortify these islands. Navy coxswains keep them on course. tiny strip of the beach, a fingernail, no more. They must get over the hump, in from the beach. This is rugged. The fingernail has been expanded. It is now a solid beach. But the forward elements are pinned down by mortar and machine gun fire. The Japanese are reported gathering for a counterattack. The quickest way to break it up is from the air. The beach calls the carriers 50 miles offshore. But the carriers too have their hands full. carry the names of ships famous in American naval history. Wasp and Essex, Enterprise and Bonhomme Richard. Fill their obligations to the men ashore. 
patrols are approaching the enemy's main defense line. You would have to be cried out with tanks. With artillery. And the machine gun. with hand grenades and gasoline bombs and finally for the foot soldier the rifle and bayonet Another Japanese refuses to stop. As usual, few of the enemy surrender. Their propagandists have made them believe that surrender means torture and death. the seaborne community is moving in to stay. The operation can officially be considered a success. Up front, the wounded are coming back. Some will recover to fight again. Some will always bear the scars of battle. They have won new airfields for Allied air power, new anchorages for Allied sea power, a new base 500 miles closer to Japan from which to launch further attacks against the enemy. Step by step, this has been the story of the advance to the gates of Japan. Step by step, this has been the price.